What's up, people? This is Invisible Walls 35. Welcome. Um, as you can tell, Shane Slatterfield is not here, but I will be filling his void this week. It's me, Grumpy McGrum. And we have a fantastic show. Uh, let's go around the table. We have Mike Damiani. Hello, everyone. The wonderful Patrick Morales. Bonjour. The incredibly arousing Daniel Bloodworth. <laughs> The always rocking Ryan Stevens. More about Daniel, please. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a little bit later, we will be having the sex god that is Johnny Chang in uh, talking about some things that arouse him. All right, on with the show. If I ever find that donkey. So first up, we're going to talk about Prince of Persia. And Johnny Chang has just dashed into the office, kicked Ryan Stevens off the microphone. Uh, so uh, Johnny, Mike Damiani, Mr. Morales, you guys have been playing this. Is it uh, a royal pain or is it a princely game? Um, I wouldn't say it's exactly rubbish, actually. Um, I would actually say that uh, much of the platforming parts of it aren't too bad. They've taken out some of the stuff that made it a little bit more difficult in the previous trilogy. For example, on the platforms when you're trying to balance walk, you don't have to balance anymore. You can just go ahead and run. So it feels a lot more streamlined. So it seems like newcomers to the series are going to have a lot more easy time getting used to this one than, say, the original Prince of Persia, Sands of Time. But uh, once it gets going, it kind of has a, it has a really good feel. The only problems are when you get stuck and you, you don't know what to do and there's a new move that you're supposed to be taught. It's kind of a little bit frustrating, like the getting the timing down for that new uh, uh, roof the ceiling climbing part where you walk along the ceiling. You have to like get the timing down a little bit. But once you get it, it feels actually pretty decent. It's not so bad. Mm -hmm. As for the combat, uh, I didn't get to play much of the combat part, so. That's what it was like in the combat part. It was just one-on-one -on -one fights and it was yeah. sporadic. It was like throughout the game, there's one boss fight, one minion. It's like. Well, I guess the essence of the one-on-one -on -one fights is that they were trying to bring it back to the original Prince of Persia where you know, you'd square off against one dude per room. Hmm. And I think for what it is, it isn't so bad. But just going back to the point about exploration, as Mike mentioned a while back, um, yeah, it's definitely less on precision and more on timing. It's pretty forgiving if uh, once you start jumping around and doing the wall runs. I actually jumped into it not too long ago for the first time, and I found myself, you know, getting through it pretty easily. Johnny was there; he saw. Um, and in re in that regard, I think it's. Maybe a little too easy, especially given the fact that you can't really fail with Elka saving you every minute. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I don't think that Elka saving you uh, is really game breaking because it's not like it helps you advance, it just expedites the process of getting back on your feet and trying again. See, one of the reasons I think the platforming is, e is easy is because you have to go back and play the whole level again to collect mm -hmm. the stupid orbs to unlock levels. It's just annoying. <laughs> Let's jump back to the combat a sec, because yeah. obviously you, know, <laughs> you were saying about the old school Prince of Persia where you'd have one guy a room. Mm -hmm. I mean, gaming's evolved, gamers have evolved. Don't we have a right to expect more battles mm -hmm. now? I mean, you know, with better engines, you know, more capabilities. I mean, you know, you can take on, you know, swarms of the horde in, uh, in Gears of War, or you can, you know, you take on bunches of bad guys. I mean, don't you expect mm -hmm. that some kick-ass flowing combat moves where you can take on multiple opponents should be a part of this game? Yeah, and, and people are entitled to that. And to be fair, people did get that in previous iterations of the new Prince of Persia revamp. Um, but quantity doesn't exactly necessi necessitate quality to me. Um, but in this case, yeah, it really doesn't seem too thrilling, you know, just to take one guy on at a time. Um, it seems pretty standard from the combat I've played. You know, block, counter, roll. It's stuff that we've, you know, come to expect from action adventure. You seem to have a heavy reliance on your little sidekick lady. I mean, you'll literally block and then you'll throw the, the, the sidekick at, you know, at the bad guy and she'll kick the crap out of him. It seems like a lot of the difficulty in the battles is removed by having your partner in the battle. Mm -hmm. Once you're within a certain striking distance, you basically can spam the button over and over again to use her and she'll perform a combo. And once the enemy recovers, if you time it right, you can keep repeating that process over and over on most of the standard battles. Now the other problem I found is there were less battles in this game, is that if you're, there's an emphasis on speed, if you're quick enough, you can get to an enemy before it spawns and outright stop it from forming. So you can eliminate much of the battles in the game outright completely. That, so reducing it to the few boss encounters that you're going to have. Okay, so um, the review will actually be up by the time um, this show hits the, the website sometime on Friday. Shane actually reviewed it, so no, nobody here did, so we, we've got differing opinions of it across the board. I'm not gonna spoil the review score for you, so you should check that out yourself. Um, so just to finish up, is this, in, in your opinion, is this Prince of Persia better than, or worse than the last one? Hmm. It's different. 
Yeah, I guess that would be the safe bet. Yeah, <laughs> if you're, there's definitely a learning curve. It's definitely not what you're going to expect right off the bat. But I think most people who are fans of the first and third one from the last trilogy will probably enjoy this one fairly well enough. <laughs> Bet you wish you'd opted for conversation now, don't you? So next up, we have a topic that, you know, in this uncertain political, cl uh, sorry, economic climate is uh, going to be close to everybody's heart, the used game market. Uh, and there's been a lot of uh, controversy here in the U.S. over the past couple of weeks with people saying that it needs government regulation. Software developers and publishers are saying they should, they deserve to take a cut out of it. And, you know, people don't have a lot of money. So this market now is obviously increasing in size with people selling the stuff on eBay or people going to their local GameStop and trading their games in. So we thought we'd uh, have a little discussion about uh, the pros and cons and what we think about it. And first up, I'm going to go to Daniel Bloodworth. Yeah, I mean, I think that it definitely has a place. I mean, I know, like, Last year, I had you know I, I wanted to go pick up the Brothers in Arms games that came out for the original Xbox. Almost impossible to find new, still almost impossible to find used copies. You know, but you know having used copies out there, especially as things that are are limited pressing, is great. The problem is, it's just so abused. You know, it's like you know trade in five of your games to get a new game, and then you know they sell each one of those for like five dollars under you know the new copies, and it just you know, it's it's not a huge savings for the consumer, but it's it's a sale that the the game is not getting. I think that, that that is the crux of the matter, especially from you know the the Joe consumer side of it, is that there are companies, and you know, let's face it, it's EB and GameStop here in the U.S. Yeah. That you know they will give you a trade in, uh, uh, you know, fee or a cash fee, whatever you prefer. And I think it's you know, it, you get half the value. I think if it if you're trading in and slightly less if you're actually selling it. And then, as you said, they'll, they'll whack it out. So if it's a new game that you've bought and it's a steaming pile of poo, you'll stick it back, they'll stick it back out and make a 50% markup on it. Yeah. That, I think, sucks. Um, I mean, for a start, you know, they, they are ripping off the, the consumer and pocketing all the money. But then the, the, the aspect that's come out over the past couple of weeks is that the publishers are saying, where's our share of this? And I actually have a problem with that. That is a, that is a big problem for me because, you know, if you buy your game, and you decide to sell it on or trade it in. That's your your business. It's your property. You know, I mean, it's impossible to do with PC games. It's impossible to do with online, you know, MMOs. But if you've got a game for the 360 or the Wii or the DS or PS3, you should be able, once you finish playing it or, you know, you just don't want to play it anymore, to be able to go and trade it in, hopefully get a good deal and put it towards something else. Now, what do you guys feel about this whole, you know, the, the likes of EA, Activision, etc., saying we want our share? I think it comes down to, I mean, again, the difference between a, a GameStop, who is making so much money off of it, and then like a, a Goodwill, you know, like being able to go through and browse through a thrift store. I mean, I don't think that that's hurting the publishers, but this, you know, constant like, you know, in your face, use games, use games, use games, right where all the new games are, you know, it's like. They are. Oh yeah. Some, sometimes you like, you can go in and you're like, wait, are these the new games or are they used games? Yeah. They get like more very <laughs> store shelf. Very misleading. They, yeah. And they do make a bigger profit margin on the used games than they do on the oh, new by, games. Oh, by a ton. Yeah, by far. And I always think it's funny when you when you, you try to buy a game and they're like their computer will pop up. You know, oh, you know we have a used one. You can save four dollars. And you're like, yeah, I like my shrink wrap. I like to peel it open. I mean, yeah. the one thing Smell I will say is, is when you do get a used game. I mean, they do have pretty stringent tests. So I've never picked up a used title that has been you know. Blown up my machine or just I have I, like uh, and I remember Hollywood Video was like purging their PS1 stock and I got like Intelligent Cube and like Fade to Black and all this like really random stuff that I wanted to have and none of them worked <laughs> when I got home and I was SOL. Yeah, but I mean, here, I mean, here's the thing: you're allowed to sell your used movies, you're allowed to sell your used music. Yeah, I mean, isn't this you're just media? Isn't this just media? And I think it was wasn't it Mark Grain from Epic Games? He was saying maybe you make. Uh, the endings of games, downloadable content or something, <laughs> as like uh, oh. as a way to, to fight used game sales. Very key code driven. I know. That's I funny. mean, for example, you know, we are doing their own version. Uh, Nintendo are doing their own version now with this Wii Voice thing. You know, the Wii Mic or whatever it is, where if you buy it used, you have to buy a coupon to actually download the service to your Wii. Because if you buy it brand new, the co you enter the coupon and you get the voice service as you know as part of the price. Yeah, you, Fantasy Star Online on the Dreamcast was like that. If you bought a used copy, I think you were pretty much screwed because you had to like register yeah. separately. Yeah. I think with on, I mean, online games, I, I, I think it's, it's just a no-brainer. I mean, there's no point buying a used online game because at the end of the day, you're coughing up your subscription cash anyway. So anybody who does that is more, is more fool them. But I, I think you know one of the messages that 
the, the game producers have to get on board is that people will want to trade in software they haven't played in a long time. It's very rare that there's games that are that good that you want to keep forever. I think there's probably only about six of the original Xbox games that I've got that I've actually wanted to keep and play on my 360. And you know, a bunch, you know, I just traded in to get uh, to get other stuff. So maybe you know, if people don't want to see GameStop profiting, here's a concept: make your games first of all better. Make you know, make sure that they're bloody good so people don't want to trade them in, and then look at downloadable content. You know, we know there's new content coming for GTA and stuff for Fallout, and uh, right now it's constantly you know. getting new stuff. Yeah, I mean, so if you have that content, you're going to want to keep your game. You're not going to want to sell it on. So maybe you know, if they actually produced better original content and downloadable content, people wouldn't be feeding the games, uh, the, the used games market. Uh, you know, and as for EB and GameStop, as far as I'm concerned, they can kiss my ass. Okay, next up, we're, we're going to talk about something a little bit different. Um, there's been the new Xbox experience from Microsoft. That's come out a couple of weeks ago. And we are in the beta stage of Sony's home experiment. So, gentlemen, what do you think about this? I'm going to start with Bloodworth because I know he's been, uh, he's been playing with both ends, as it were. Yeah, well, the, the Xbox experience, the, uh, the avatar I ended up liking a lot better than I expected. I was able to actually throw together an avatar that really does look like me. Yeah, definitely more options than the Nintendo Me at any rate. But yeah, but with the Nintendo Me, you can make like really messed up things like Miss Piggy. Yeah, like, I guess. Yeah, you can I mean, only make the humans. Me is I'm like sure you'll be able to do scribbles. that. Just have to pay a couple of dollars extra for, to mm. download some I don't know. theme packs and stuff. I've seen some really weird Me's. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, isn't this a case of, you know, I mean, th this whole thing is more like Me Too, if you pardon the pun, where Microsoft have just gone and ripped off the Me. I mean, you know, do you it doesn't need sound like that, though, from the development side. I mean, I've, you know, I've had friends that interviewed Rare, and, and you know, just kind of like how Nintendo had this idea back in the 80s, and it eventually became Miis. You know, Rare's had this idea for these characters for a long time, too. So, I mean, maybe it's maybe the Mii is what inspired Microsoft to go ahead with it, but, I mean, it's not like they just directly ripped it off. The experience itself is what I'm less happy with, because instead of me just popping up into my games channel like it used to be, I pop up into this spotlight thing. Yeah, you, know? you don't even pop into your game anymore. If you've got a game in the CD tray, you have to pop. You have to go up a couple of levels on the menu, so the game doesn't auto load anymore. And I have is there no to, auto load option? I have been able to find a really? way to turn that off. Uh, yeah, I mean, every time I've tried to System play Fallout, I end up seeing the spotlight section first. And I, I must admit, I haven't really buried, you know, spent too much time looking for this turn off this option. But it shouldn't be a f default. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. funny because they're definitely trying to make it easier to navigate, but I think in the process it ended up being more difficult. Well, I think they made it easier to put billboards up. Yeah, yeah oh, they're, they're advertising Here's a, a big lot more. bright spot. Oh, check that out. That looks And cool. I'm, I'm not so upset about that, because I like to know when some stuff's on like Xbox Live Arcade and stuff like that, uh, compared to the little news ticker mm -hmm. that Sony has right now. But then on yeah. the other hand, the cross-media bar is ridiculously easy to navigate, copy files, et cetera, et cetera, really easy to use. Yeah. And then they're going to add home to it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Let me walk over here and sit on a virtual couch. Well, we'll, we'll touch on home in, in a minute, but I actually, you know, perhaps I'm being, you know, old school, you know, mid middle aged gamer that I am. Uh, I actually preferred the original Xbox Live experience. Yeah. Oh, same here. Yeah, I think this one looks well, Netflix more like, is cool. Well, it, look, it looks more like a PowerPoint. It looks like yeah. a PowerPoint presentation. I half expect some marketing dingbat's voice to start talking about <laughs> this is where we were thinking outside the box, above the line, below the profit margin. See, blah, but blah, I just blah. really don't care, really. I mean, it's still not that bad or anything, and yeah. it's not like I like the other one that much. It's like, what were they called before? Blades? Yeah. It's like, whatever. <laughs> I can still play my game. It's not like ridiculously hard to figure out. Like, I had like 10 seconds where I was like, wait, where's my game? But it's like, I don't really care. The avatar things are forgettable. forgettable. I haven't made a new me in six months, probably. It's like, whatever, I want to play games. I want to play games, too, and I just, uh, I just don't like having to wait through 400 yeah, hours. Yeah, I mean, that's menus. the thing. Like, I want to see my games, and I want to see my friends. And they don't give you the option to like, customize your blades. And like, exactly. one day, like, I, I like, popped in, I was right on my game, and I'm like, whoa, what happened? And I'm like, oh, I'm disconnected from live right now. Okay, so we've talked about the new Xbox experience. Let's take a, a little moment to, to, to talk about Home, the oft-delayed 455 consecutive betas little uh, version of Second Life uh, that Sony has. It seems like Second Life to me anyway, only without the Dutch pedophiles. What's, you know, what's the take on this one? 
the funny thing to me is that the expanded invites went out like two days after the Xbox experience. So it's almost like Sony was like, oh no, like, you know, people are making avatars and having fun, like, let's give them our <laughs> avatars. This so was a bit like, you know, Sarah Palin being announced as uh, VP directly after Barack Obama got the nomination type thing. You know, trying to steal some Sunday. Hey, savvy marketing from Sony. But I still maintain that this doesn't look like something I want on my console. I mean, you know, I don't want to be wandering around a virtual environment. I want quick, easy access through my menus and not walking through. Well, I don't yeah. think the cross media bar is going anywhere. Yeah, and they'll they'll, they'll give you some incentives to occasionally check out your, your cool crib and hang with your homies or, or whatnot. Homies. I think it's a selling point, but I think like, like Second Life, it's like, wow, how many freaking academics have, or media dar it's a media darling. People write about Second Life all the time. And they're like, there's a billion subscribers, and then you find out it's the same like 12 people with 100 accounts. And I think you're going to see the same thing with Home. There's going to be some people that use it to like a limited degree, some people who may even do use it as their home, their like complete interface. But I think most people, they'll mess around with it and they'll forget about it. But it's a selling point for Sony. I think the difference is that Second Life is dominated more more by PC nerds who you know are more. Oh yeah, if you've ever been on Second Life, all they do is talk about building. Yeah, I mean yeah. that's what they do: building and trying and trying to make cash. I mean at the end of the day, Home is coming onto a console. Uh, on a major console at that, and again, people buy the consoles, play the games, and, and get in. Um, yeah, I mean, I didn't see anything to me that looked like it was trying to replace the interface. I mean, there was, I mean, it was pretty much just like, you know, a walk around, open world chat room, and it was pretty funny to see people that didn't realize like exactly how things were working. So there were these two guys that were like, they were like, oh, let's go sneak up on this girl, you know, talking out loud, and like everybody can hear you. Talking about sneaking up yeah. <laughs> so. on that girl quotes. <laughs> yeah, and of course none of the girls are actually girls in there, but you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean that, that's the that's the other thing is that you know you're going to get all the uh, closet transvestites the spending a fortune at the Sony store to get the latest Sony branded mini skirts for their little avatars. I, I do think though, you know, before they come out with this for the mass audience, they need to work on their avatar creator. Yeah, it's like. It's, it's not anywhere nearly as simple as the Miis or the Xbox avatars. It's not easy to make somebody that looks like you. It's just all of these weird sliders and like, you know, like facial parts and like, oh, expand and contract your forehead. I'm like, okay, does that look more like me or not? <laughs> Don't even see what the difference is. Well, I suppose the other thing is they, they've just got to make the home system useful. I mean, it's got to serve some sort of purpose other than being a glorified 3D chat room. Which well, you, you know, they anyway. keep saying your trophies will show up in your trophy room and like is there's club what was the there's what was the one does anybody there's like some that. no there's going to be mini games that you can like if you buy I can't remember what game it is there's some game that if you buy it it will unlock mini games in home for you to play and billiards and stuff yeah, I mean, just yeah, playing but it's like and bowling with some guys. I mean, of course, it's not as good as Wii bowling, but I mean, you can just go bowling hanging out and talking. Yeah, but I mean, you're not playing with other people, you know. I just think, uh, again, perhaps this is perhaps a slightly older gamer talking, but I think if you're going to do it in that sort of environment, you might as well just bugger off to a bowling alley with your mates and uh, yeah. you know, get drunk and stare at girls. That sounds terrifying. Round two, fight! All right, the next up we are going to talk about another classic franchise that's back. It's uh, Super Hyper Mega Street Fighter 36 Deluxe Ultra Version 4.3. Or whatever it's called, <laughs> Patrick. You've been yes, playing this. Right. Tell me. Well, first of all, give us the full title because um, it's beyond me. I believe the full title is uh, Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo HD Remix Part Six: The Phantom Menace. All right. Yes. So tell you know, tell us. I mean, Street Fighter. Well, I guess as anyone can tell you in the office, I'm a huge Street Fighter fan, and I've been looking forward to this for a while now. Even Justin, who I'm sure shares the same opinion as I do. Um, but I I love it. You know, it's a, it's a great game. They did lots of cool gameplay tweaks with it. The online netcode is really worth waiting for because thus far it's been pretty smooth for me. Johnny, I've been, yeah, I've been having difficulties so, playing online on the Xbox Live personally. Yeah, but you're, you, you're, yeah, you're telling me earlier that Xbox Live had some problems for you. But I don't know. For me, PSN's been pretty smooth so far. That was something they definitely stressed earlier with you know smoothing out a good net netcode for mm -hmm. playing online. And I guess it's a you know up and down deal, but for the most part, it's been pretty good for me. Um, I guess my only gripe with it is that the graphics haven't really been as you know awesome as we all thought it would be. Yeah, that was a big disappointment. The background, yeah. especially the background for me, it's just like the details in the background mm -hmm. in the previous Street Fighter. It was a lot more yeah. there. Actually. 
I think the biggest thing is that there's a huge disconnect there because it still uses the main frame framework of the original Street Fighter 2 with the same you know frame counts mm -hmm. and everything, but it just kind of gives it a new paint job with with the Udon graphics, and it looks really jerky in action. Yeah, the frame rates. A little bit so it, it, there's a bit of a disconnect there, but in <coughs> terms of gameplay, I think it's really solid, and uh, you know if you're a Street Fighter fan, obviously it's a good choice to pick up, especially for 15 bucks. I mean, it's interesting to me. It's a franchise that's 15 years old. Mm -hmm. or, or, you know, I mean, Street Fighter 2. I remember Street Fighter 2 coming into the store that I was working at uh, on the Super NES, and everybody was blown away. It was so, you know, it was uh, you know, arcade perfect in our eyes back then, and it was just a lot of fun. But having you know watched everybody playing it, and I don't know whether again I'm a little bit jaded, and perhaps I was expecting more. Mm -hmm. It just looks like the old school Street Fighter, and you know, I mean, let's face it, how many, you know, tornado kicks and how many, <laughs> uh, you know, fireballs can you throw uh, before it gets old and repetitive? Yeah, HG Remix, I guess, runs heavily on you know nostalgia, and you know, just playing the classic Street Fighter. But for what it's worth, they actually did some really good improvements with it. Um, David Serlin, who was in charge of managing all of the gameplay tweaks really made a consistent effort in, you know, bringing even the shittiest characters up to par. Uh, you know, people who used to be on the bottom string, like Zangief, they're actually really intimidating threats now. And it, it definitely changes the scene a lot for people who've, you know, played the same game for 15 or odd years. Um, you know, things are changing around, the online scene is really strong now. And I think it, it's it's doing good to be kind of the precursor to Street Fighter Four, which is, you know, heading to us next year. How much was a uh Street Fighter HD remix on the PSN. It's the same price, fifteen bucks. Fifteen bucks. Yeah. And you know, fifteen bucks is obviously a step up because a lot of games have been nine ninety nine. Yeah. Eight hundred mm -hmm. points. I mean, is is it worth the extra five bucks? I would say so, especially you know if you. It's the kind of game that pays for itself over time because if you have you know just fifteen minutes of free time hopping on to play a quick match, that's probably the best deal. I I definitely see foresee myself playing it a bunch you know, and. The long road leading up to Street Fighter Four. You know, the question I have to ask is: I went through so many, so many Super NES control pads uh, playing the original Street Fighter Two Turbo. How's it hold up on you know the the PlayStation Six <laughs> axis, uh, which is you know in my opinion a rather lightweight um, you know controller, and then obviously you've got the slightly more sub substantial uh, you know 360 controller. But again, I mean, how are they holding up? Are, are we going to need to order out for more joypads? We need joypads now. Oh, yeah. yeah, we do. <laughs> we need joysticks. Uh, but in terms of the the joy the D pads on the six axis, I think the six axis is fairly decent. It's just the 360 one that is a pretty huge pain to deal with, personally. Up is down, down is up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
What's that I smell? Microtransactions? <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's just absolute bollocks. I mean, and EA is probably you know, rubbing their hands at the prospect of an outcry because we're going to talk about it, we're going to get pissed off, and then they're going to say, ah, oh, yes, we're bringing it to, you know, we're going to bring it to the US through the public demand. My problem is that it shouldn't be developed by somebody in fucking Asia. They should find somebody in the UK who can understand the sense of humor and you know, give it that edge that the original games have. And if you haven't played the original games, you can go and pick them up in, you know, bargain bins at Walmart or Best Buy or wherever for you know a couple of dollars now and you know there's a patch to make Dungeon Keeper 2 run on Windows Vista I should know because I downloaded it so I can <laughs> run the freaking game on Vista um, but you, you know it's such a fun experience it's risque it's a bit near the knuckle it's a little saucy but it's just a really cool concept where you just get to play the bad guy there's no you know out and out swearing there's no nudity it's not GTA but it's a lot of fun. You get to slap your imps around, build torture chambers for your, your you know, your uh, mistresses to go and whip people, and it's just a bunch of good old-fashioned Benny well, Hill style fun. Why don't you? You can always cross your fingers for uh, Overlord Two. Oh, screw Overlord <laughs> Two. I want Dungeon Keeper Three. I want Dungeon Keeper Three or a proper MMO version of Dungeon Keeper. Okay, it's time for On The Hook, where you submit your questions to us, and we laugh at them. I mean, we answer them. Um, <laughs> as always, please send your questions to invisiblewalls at gametrailers.com, and do not submit them to my personal account via Facebook, because it really fucks me off. And uh, submit your username. Yes, and submit your username, or you get no Game Trailers dollars. Uncle Ryan will close the purse strings. I Mr. Have Bloodworth, you have a question? Yes, I have one from Sprite Sprayer. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> Yes. Uh, what do you think will be the biggest advancement when we look back at this generation of gaming? Is uh, misused as it is. I mean, I, I think you know the Wii and interactive gaming, as far as Rock Band and Guitar Hero all goes. You know, I mean, I think that's where it comes down to. You know, giving people another way to play, and hopefully with the Motion Plus attachment in the next generation, that will expand to you know be a lot better and not just be shaking your arms until they fall off. Well, I have some good <laughs> games to support it. Uh, anybody else? I think on a very like uh, plateaued view, you know, you you look at how games progress, and I think you really do have to give HD graphics. And I know the Xbox had them, and Xbox One had them on some games. I know PCs had high resolution graphics forever, but it's really the most immediate thing you can kind of point at and say, here we have games that look better than they ever had before, and you know that factors in physics and stuff like that. And to a lesser degree, doesn't really factor it in, but I mean, AI is improved and stuff like that. Anytime I think Halo is not much, I just go and replay a part, and I'm like, pretty good AI. <laughs> Patrick, for me personally, I think you know, with the advent of broadband and you know, good computers, the fact that you know, digital distribution through channels like Steam becoming somewhat of a reality these days is a pretty big advancement, in my opinion, and it's proven pretty good. I mean, you've seen people pre-ordering Left for Dead, and then you've seen people getting all of the episodic content from Half Life Two. And you know it's trickling down to other places too. Blizzard is starting to implement their own Steam-like service, so I think you know. And then all three consoles have their own. Yeah, stores. yeah. I can't forget about PSN and Xbox Live. So it's it's definitely shaping up to be a viable thing. You know, closing the gap between consumer and you know developer, and I think that's cool. Mr. Damiani. Oh, that was. One of my answers right there. All right, <laughs> fine, there you go. Download a little um, content. Yeah. All right, well, um, fair enough. The, the thing I'd actually say is the user-generated content and how that started to come into games. I think yeah. that's a great thing. Little Big Planet is obviously one of them. Um, you know, there's a lot more games letting you create levels and upload them. Can I say um, Doom Wads again? You can say <laughs> Doom Wads because people love the sound of your Doom Wads. And, you know, I mean, again, this is something that PC games players have, been, have had for a long time, you know, from Counter Strike and before and Doom. And mm -hmm. uh, I think it's just great. It's coming out on the consoles. And, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, we'll get to see stuff. Fallout 3 is coming out on the PC with an editor. There's mm -hmm. an editor being released. It would be nice to see a workable version of that come onto a console soon so that you can upload your own content. And then you've got stuff like uh, you know, the Xbox Live SDKs that the, the, the developers are making their own little games and releasing oh, yeah, and yeah. stuff like that. Still waiting for Dishwasher. Whatever happened to that? Hmm. Good question. Yeah. The Dishwasher broke. <laughs> 
All right, that wraps up another Invisible Walls. We will be back next week with uh, hopefully Shane back 100% in the hundred percent more Shane. A hundred percent more Shane, unless I you know lose the cabinet key and let it you know <laughs> leave him locked up. Um, just a reminder: the Spike VGAs are coming up on the fourteenth of December on Spike TV. Keep an eye out on GameTrailers.com over the coming weeks because there's a lot of nice exclusive trailers and bits of info being released as uh, as we go along. And this time next week uh, on Invisible Walls, we will be doing something a little different. I think we'll do our own version of the VGAs, which will be slightly different, I think, to theirs and probably less serious. Uh, check us out, as always, on Facebook. Uh, subscribe to us on iTunes. I don't think there's anything else I need to pimp for right now. Uh, on behalf of the team, this is uh, Marcus Beer saying, Shane, we miss you. Come home. And thank you for listening and watching, and we'll be back next week.